Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the DD Geopolitics Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am joined today by professional cynic and realist black pilled Mark Sloboda. Mark, how are you? You already look unamused. Um, no, that's actually my happy face. <laughs> well, maybe you are happy. I don't know. There's currently uh, some airstrikes happening right now in the Odessa region. Um, and then what do you make of, I think we have actually have a compilation of last night's strikes. If we want to show that really quickly to the audience while people can come into the room, go ahead and show them. Вы хотите декоммунизации? Ну что же, нас это вполне устраивает. Но не нужно, что называется, останавливаться на полпути. Мы готовы показать вам, что значит для Украины настоящая декоммунизация. Ракета A good amount of strikes on Kiev, the Kiev region. Um, what do you think about this uptick or this kind of massive strike uh, package that we saw last night? People are saying now this is the biggest one that they've seen yet. Are we seeing a sort of gloves off moment? Uh, Sarah, first, uh, thanks for having me on. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be on Double D Geopolitics. Um, I would say that, uh, first of all, airstrikes don't make me happy. Um, I'll be happy when this war is over, the regime in Kiev is removed, and the uh, Banderites are all sent to Bandera heaven. That's 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 when I'll be happy again, which probably means years in the future. So until then, I'll just have to suffer through. So as long as you're interviewing me, so will you. <laughs> um <laughs> But I do want to, I mean, we, we have the, we recently had the election, which obviously Putin was going to win anyway. But then today, after this massive salvo package, we have Peskov coming out and saying Russia is at war. This is the first time that he has used the word war. This is the first time it's ever come from an official uh, in Russia. What does this mean? And what uh, where we saw that we get the quote and we are on an uptick in tempo. What what are we looking at here? Okay, so let me let me hit the the airstrikes first. Okay, so um, the last major uh, missile strikes, major, right, uh, that Russia made was 44 days ago, which means that for a month and a half, um, uh, Russia has not launched major missile strikes, missile drone strikes, some small things, but nothing. Uh, on the large scale for a month and a half. And it's not because they didn't have missiles or drones. Even the Western mainstream media has given up that propaganda point largely. Um, it's because they're saving them up. They, they didn't see a need for striking the targets at that point. And as far as I'm concerned, Russia has started hoarding missiles for NATO. They're, they're hoarding missiles for almost certainly the inevitable direct and open NATO intervention, which is looking a lot sooner than I thought it would. It's looking like it may happen sometime later this year. Uh, I didn't think it would happen for another year or two, but um, it, it seems that the timetable has been jumped up. Um, I think that this round of airstrikes, um, uh, there's a number of reasons for it. I, I think there is definitely 
um, on one level, a gut punch response to the strikes on Belgorod, uh, largely against civilians, uh, but also to the drone strikes that the Kiev regime has been making uh, against uh, Russian oil refineries and other energy infrastructure um, over the last two weeks. Um, these aren't hugely significant strikes, but they generated an ungodly amount of Western press because, you know, they look for anything that is any possible success of the Kiev regime. And there is some evidence, whether it's direct correlation uh, or not, um, a ca causation uh, is that oil prices uh, around the world uh, have been going up. I think they were already on an upswing. Perhaps this accelerated it. Uh, but evidently, according to the Western media, according to Politico and other sources, the Biden admin has since asked the Kiev regime to lay off the strikes on oil refinery facilities. Yeah, it's quite interesting that they did that. Yeah, uh, quite publicly. Uh, one of the reasons they listed is because global energy prices are going up. And of course, Joe Biden's reelection is coming up. And we all know that one of the few things American voters actually care about is gasoline prices. Gasoline. And Biden is not looking at a very high chance of reelection to begin with, at least according to the polls as they stand right now. So he certainly doesn't need that complication. And that's really just a really dumb strategy of the Kiev regime. Let's hurt Russia by destroying their energy facilities and driving the global price of oil up. Well, what happens when the global price of oil goes up? The Russian government makes more money hand over fist, right? So maybe they're selling somewhat less oil, right? While they have to deal up with the damage control. Uh, but what they are selling, they're making much more money on. So it's, it's, I really, all of these strategies of hurting uh, Russia as the major global commodity supplier of gas, of oil, of wheat, of titanium, aluminum, um, uh, uranium, all, all of these resources that are vital components of the global market is, uh, it's always shooting themselves in the foot. So that was always a really dumb strategy. Uh, the other reason they listed is because the potential for Russian um, uh, quid pro quo, which is, I think, at some level, at least part of what we're seeing now. You attack our energy facilities, we'll attack your energy facilities. And that's a major part of these strikes. So on the first night, uh, so uh, already two salvos ago, um, while there were targets all over Ukraine, it did seem that Kiev received more attention than other sources. And we all know they shot down, they, they successfully managed to intercept every Russian missile and drone with their command and control and military industrial facilities. Uh, they 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 successfully managed to maneuver those facilities into the range of Russia's cruise missiles and causing them to self-destruct upon impact, which which is, I guess, another way of saying we hit every single target and destroyed everything uh, as the number. I've actually seen more videos leak out of Kiev of the strikes uh, on Kiev than I have seen in in a long time, because, of course, it is illegal to post, to talk about, to think about Russian strikes being successful in Ukraine, right? And any of those could certainly see you uh, imprisoned and has seen people imprisoned. If you're a male, it will simply result in you being automatically sent to have day of confront or, or somewhere else pleasant like that. Perhaps a, a attempt to resuscitate Krinky, you know, some, some uh, quick one-way ticket to Bandera Hell. Um, so, um, that was the, the first night of strikes, supposedly command and control and military industrial facilities like drone, uh, workshops and the like were, were top of the list, but that's, you know, we, we, we don't know for sure. Um, now, um, last night, early this morning, again, a widespread of attacks, but in particular for the first time in a year. 
Uh, Russia uh, began targeting the Kiev regime's electrical infrastructure again in a major way. And unlike last year, uh, last year when Russia made these strikes, they were not destroying energy generative facilities, right? They weren't destroying plants. They no. were going after distribution. They were yeah, going after nodes and substations, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but things already appear quite different this time yeah. as one of the major targets was the uh, hydroelectric power station yes. Uh, yes. in Dnieper Protovsk uh, on the Dnieper River. Uh, not the dam itself, but the power uh, uh, generative uh, facilities. And evidently they are completely destroyed, which is going to shut down power to a whole big swath uh, of, of the uh, center of the country there. Uh, likewise, Kharkov was hit by some accounts 18 times, and Kharkov is completely blacked out. They got no electricity, no internet, nothing. Uh, and uh, there's not there's also some effects in Odessa and likewise. Uh, so this is something new. This is something different. They're going after power generation. Now, why is the question, right? Uh, why why specifically these targets? Well, one of the you know one is simply payback infrastructure for infrastructure. Okay, maybe that pays into it at some level. Sure. Um, there's always the question of logistics. Is Russia about to launch a major offensive? If so, then they want the Kiev regime to have difficulty moving its troops and armaments around the country. Logistics. And the way to do that, because this is done by trains in both Ukraine and Russia, um, and trains in both countries are largely powered by electricity, you take out the electricity, you take out the logistics, right? Uh, paralyzes regime forces. Uh, so that, that's a possibility as well. Um, there's something else probably at play as well. And that has to do with the limited remnants of Western air defense that the Kiev regime has at this point. Uh, since there haven't been any major missile strikes in the, in 44 days until this week, uh, the, a strategy, I don't, we don't know whether it was cooked up by Kiev or NATO or, or what, but was to take these non-mobile air defense systems like Patriot launchers and Iris T launchers and move them up to the front lines because Russia's use of the guided uh, glide bombs, the FAB uh, in, in their various iterations, now evidently up to the 3,000 kilogram big babies as well, is probably what I would consider the second big game-changing weapon of this war after the Lancet and, and its evolutions. Uh, and even the Western mainstream media is now admitting the damage these things. These are the equivalent of the U.S. JDAMs. Uh, except probably better uh, in, in, in terms of range and, and targeting and, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the possibility for the amount of munitions uh, being involved. And they've been used extremely uh, heavily. In the last few days of Avdeevka, the last few days, they dropped some 500 fab bombs on Evdeevka. That's why it was all folded up so quickly and that the rout of Kiev regime forces occurred because these these things, even if you're any not in the direct impact, you're going to get a concussion and a brain injury in a much larger range. And we've seen some videos of that. They just shatter morale. They, they, they shatter soldiers, uh, these impacts. Um, and uh, they just destroy fortifications. You, you got to turn a, a residential building into a fortification. Boom, one bomb, one, maybe two or three buildings destroyed. That's it. Uh, it it's all said and done. And they have also allowed Russian forces to advance and advance again. I saw in one day after Avdeevka, uh, the Kiev regime forces tried to tried vainly to hold Lastichkina for a, a village west of Avdeevka for uh, a few days. They dropped 60 fabs just on Lastichkina in uh, um, one afternoon.
so they're 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 just going crazy with these things, and the West doesn't know how to counter them. Uh, and the Kiev regime doesn't have enough air defense left because the West can't provide it, either the launchers or the interceptors, to cover everything. So they move these launchers close to the front lines, what they had left, in an attempt to try to ambush troops uh, and am ambush Russian aircrafts involved in this. And I think that's exactly what happened in Belgorod uh, a little over a month ago when they knocked down that plane, the Il-76, uh, full of their own POWs. It was the same kind of tactic. And they've claimed some outrageous success with this strategy, which is probably only uh, a fraction. Uh, they probably only managed to take down a few Su-34s, maybe. But anyway, the, the, the end all of this is that it wasn't terribly effective, and Russia has been able to track down these very valuable and irreplaceable launch systems. And now the Kiev regime is left with a conundrum. Right? Do they withdraw their the, the few air defense systems that they have left to Kiev to defend this the city Kiev or uh, other big cities, or do they leave them out in the field? They're going to either sacrifice their capital city and and other major cities, or they're going to leave their troops to be even more unrestricted, fabbed into the ground. It's a tough choice. Uh, and I think that's a major part of what we have going on here as well. I think actually, I mean, there's always multiple reasons why things are done. And last year when the logistics, when uh, the, the uh, Russia targeted the Kiev regime's electrical infrastructure, sure, part of it was logistics, yes. But I think another major consideration was sussing out and hitting the then largely Soviet uh, air defense system that um, uh, that the Kiev regime still had. Uh, it, if they tried to defend their electrical infrastructure, then they revealed their air defense systems, and that was the real target. Uh, and that has led up over time to where we are now, where the Kiev regime, even after you know this ad hoc Western systems being provided to them to replace. That hasn't lasted very long, and they're they're just dying. The um, Western media tells us that by the end of March, which is next week, the Kiev regime will be largely out of air defense interceptor missiles. That's that's what we were told in the Western press in the last couple of weeks. And I don't think they'll be completely out, but it's obvious that the supply of them is too small. It's not sustainable. Uh, and Russia will largely have air superiority over not only the contact line, but much of Ukraine. So you're going to see much much increased use of air power, probably even in close air support roles uh, in the summer. So you mentioned NATO, you mentioned NATO troops in there. So um, we've got a lot of like NATO sort of blowhards uh, kind of posturing. Uh, we don't really know, especially France, Macron. Um, there's a possibility that there's some French troops in Romania. Some have said, said they've even been spotted in Odessa. And then today, ever the zealot, Pepe Escobar, always overexcited, but he did make a post that says <laughs> regular troops from France, Germany, and Poland have arrived by rail and air to Cherkasy. Uh, a substantial, substantial force, no numbers have been leaked. They are being housed in schools for all, pra for all practical purposes. This is a NATO force. How Likely, do you think this is uh, how how soon do you think we'll see a NATO like regular troops uh, in a formation? Like, what what do we be? Where do you think this is headed? Yeah, um, what I, I missed that myself. Um, what what countries? What oh, were so, uh, he said France, Germany, and Poland, and they are they've already arrived within the border. Uh, they're at Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I don't I don't believe. I actually I don't believe. I don't I don't believe that Germany is there yet, and I don't believe that Poland is there. That it's possible that there are some troops in. I've heard you know telegram chatter that they were moving through Bulgaria and Romania. So. You know, um, French troops, I think, is a very real possibility, right, in in a relative near future, right? We've heard 
uh, Nerishkin say, uh, you know, the Russian uh, foreign intelligence, SVR, uh, had say that they know that France is planning to send uh, an initial wave of 2,000 troops to be backed up by 20,000 probably within a month or two. Um, and I am sure that other countries are going to kick in, even publicly. All right. And we, we don't believe anything for Western governments say at face value, right? They've lied, they've lied, they've lied again. So saying they won't or we have no plans at this time doesn't mean anything. Uh, but we've heard in the uh, positive towards sending troops from the Baltics, of course, the yapping uh, dogs um, uh, from Finland, uh, from Czech, um, and from Canada. <laughs> from Justin Trudeau. All right, those are the ones we know who were already uh, hot and public uh, on this idea other than Macron. And um, I, I think when we're considering why Macron has suddenly become this huge war hawk, we have to consider two things. Um, one is the French anger over Russia, either directly or simply exploiting the situation the French being kicked out of their neo-colonial um, right. influence in the Sahel, uh, in, uh, in Northwest Africa, uh, and, and uh, them turning uh, in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso to Wagner or whatever descendant of Wagner we're on now, uh, or whether it's actual Russian military. Uh, but uh, as, as security providers. Uh, so they're furious about that. I mean, they, they regard that as theirs, as their sphere of influence. Uh, so, and we've practically stolen that sphere of influence from them at this point. Or I think it would be fairer to say that is, that is actually very colonialist itself. The Africans have taken back their own countries and they've looked to us for inspiration and help. And, and that's, that's the situation. Uh, they're so they're furious about that. But I think also there must have been something, uh, this event that happened in Kharkov now, I guess, about two months ago, where Russia uh, uh, launched some missile strikes and hit what they called a temporary emplacement of mercenaries, right? And then provided specifics that some 60, some French were killed. Um, and um, the uh, Macron uh, government at first denied it and then said, oh, maybe they were French, but they were just mercenaries. And uh, the Russian, uh, they, the French ambassador was summoned to the Russian foreign ministry. And evidently there was screaming going on and evidently they refused to stop doing what they're doing. And what they were doing, what, what French there were doing was probably two different groups of French in Kharkov. One of them was operating uh, French-provided air defense uh, and possibly Caesar um, howitzers as well. The other group of French, uh, and these evidently were uh, French foreign legion of Russian and Ukrainian ancestry or extraction. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and they were training up the Russia Volunteers Corps. Denise Kapustin or um, Nikitin, however you want to call them, the neo-Nazis that are fighting for the Kiev regime, the neo-Nazis who have been launching these border raids, completely ineffective, but uh, into Belgorod for the you know over a week now in their attempts to disrupt the election, provide cover, possibly for a Ukrainian uh, special forces operation to steal nuclear weapons at a facility in Belgorod region. That's that's something that's been floated around. But uh, whatever it is, this is what the French were doing. They were training people for attacks on Russia and, and possibly participating them as well, which is why they were hit in Kharkov, you know, well before this happened. The French were ex furious about this. They refused to back down. They refused to admit it or anything. And then evidently secretly, not so secretly, they sent some French officers to collect the bodies and Russia hit them again. <laughs> um, and you may consider that cruel, but that's the type of war this is on both sides. Get used to it. Um, so I think that uh, in 
France and Paris, they went ballistic at this. I think that Macron has, you know, with his Napoleonic complex, his incredible ego and vanity, he took this as some type of personal offense. And that's why he has so suddenly become this, this big hawk and is willing to send his own troops. And I have no doubt it's going to happen. And of course, here's the thing. They don't believe, they seriously believe that putting NATO troops under flag in Ukraine in whatever capacity, and probably initially it would just be in West Ukraine or in Odessa at a training uh, capacity, or there's the idea that they could put them on the border with Belarus in order to free up, uh, what, territorial defense units? I don't, I don't know. Um, that, that seems a little less likely to me. But there's all kinds of things that are being tossed around. NATO does not have a good plan for waging conventional war against Russia in Ukraine. They do not. They don't have the capacity right now. Everyone knows it. So they don't really know what they're doing. At some level, they still really believe that Russia will not hit them. I, I don't know where they're getting this from, but they keep talking about it again and again, that the, their presence will prevent Russia from striking certain facilities in Ukraine. So they're sending them there as human tripwire forces, right? Believing that Russia won't hit them. They are terribly, terribly mistaken. And Russia has said it again and again and again. We heard the Russian uh, ambassador to France, Peter uh, Tolstoy, uh, on French TV um, just uh, uh, last evening saying, we will kill every French soldier who comes to Ukraine. We will kill everyone. We will kill every one of them. He said it again and again and again in those blunt terms. That matter of fact, and when they brought up Macron, we don't care about Macron. When they brought up France as a nuclear power, so what? We're a nuclear power. We've got more and better nuclear weapons than you do. Your nuclear weapons aren't going to save French soldiers in Ukraine. So they made it very, very clear. And I think that that is most likely also uh, what we have heard uh, from Peskov today. And I was shocked when I first heard it. Peskov said we're at war, that it's a war now, that is the special military operation over? Have have we changed the classification? I was I was confused. Yes. Um, so I was I was confused at first. Um and um, he said it directly, not about Ukraine, but he said it in the specific context of the West, that since the West became a direct participant in the conflict. Now we are at war. And I was shocked because this isn't just semantics as they presented in the West. There are very real domestic and international and international law repercussions of Russia openly calling this a war. It changes what kind of targeting the Russian military can do. It changes rules on mobilization and um, uh, uh, economic uh, appropriation in the country. It, it has international effects uh, in the UN uh, with regards to activation of treaties. It, it, it's huge. Uh, and then it was like just hours after, it wasn't immediately afterwards, but Peskov then Afterwards, speaking to journalists said, oh, we're only de facto at war, still de jour. De jour. Legally, it's a special military operation. So right. it was like, psych. And I'm like, you bastard. Yeah, you I was like, it. no. <laughs> you stole it, right? Uh, well, I'm not so sure if I would be excited about it, but it was huge news. And I think the reason for this game, it was obviously intended that way, right? And because coming from the Russian presidential spokesman, we couldn't ignore it. It's not like Medvedev going off ranting about, you know, dissecting Ukraine until nothing is left or or uh, whatever, um, you know, uh, Medvedev, the new Zhirinovsky. Um, it you know, not not Medvedev, the American boy uh, dancer, uh, if you remember that era. Um, but uh, anyway, I think that this is what part of this was. This was, again, intended as a deterrent signal about how serious Russia is to the West. 
do not send NATO or NATO member state troops to Ukraine. Uh, we will be at war then. That's that's what the message is. I think that that that's perfectly clear. And they went through this little bit of theater about, oh, OK, we're not def we're just de facto at war hours later. It, it probably caused much more reaction in D.C. than in Langley than it did even to me, you know, watching that that come across the news ticker uh, news feeds. Uh, at home, but uh, that was that was kind of shocking. But I think, again, it is intended to punch home again. If you send troops in, we will hit them. It's not a bluff. We will hit them, and we will hit them as the first priority. And I think that's why Russia has been saving up missiles uh, for a very large extent. And that's possibly also one of the rationales for this new missile strike as to be very, very demonstrative with it. This will happen to your troops too if they step foot in Ukraine under under their own flag. And we've we've heard uh, uh, last week there was also this supposed conference in Odessa where there was supposedly large number of NATO officers attending a military conference as well. So I suspect that probably we're in the hundreds of NATO um, specialists and officers have, have been killed at this point already. Uh, I think it's inevitable that at some point uh, NATO troops will be sent directly into this conflict. NATO member state troops, probably not NATO as a whole. We all know Hungary uh, and Slovakia uh, want no part of this, to be sure. And NATO requires consensus. And Germany seems very hesitant on the idea, although, you know, they they lied about Minsk. So what else are they lying about? We don't know. Uh, but we've heard from the, the French uh, chief of the general staff that they are ready for war with Russia. Right. We also heard the NATO secretary general say the same thing. Bullshit. They're not fucking ready for war with Russia. And we've had it from the French press who said that the French artillery supplies are so low at this point that they don't have enough artillery for four days of intense combat uh, in Ukrainian style uh, uh, in, in war with Russia uh, if, if they were in Ukraine. They can't even provide artillery shells to the Kiev regime forces. How are they going to provide them for their own troops as well? Do they think that NATO air power is going to save them? I, no fly zone? You know, that's crazy because then they'll be flying into the face, not only of the entire Russian air force, which has largely been held in reserve during this conflict, but the best integrated air defense and electronic warfare network system in the world, hands down, and the last two years have proven it. So uh, as, as Medvedev has been very vocal in saying, bring it on, bring it on. Let's, let's, let's do this and, and have, have it over with. Uh, I think if it doesn't happen in the near future, and Macron has given us every reason, even Narishkin has said that the French will be the first, and it might be happening right as we speak, might happen in the next month, but it will happen at some point, and it will be more than France. Remember, this is just after Avdeevka. Avdeevka, 12 kilometers from Donetsk City, right? This is over Avdeevka. And what, when Russia starts moving on Kharkov, on Kiev, on Odessa, and we've heard Macron specifically mention Kiev and Odessa. So um, we, we know that those are probably triggers for NATO. They can't back down. They believe that U.S.-led Western global hegemony, as they call it, the rules-based order. We make the rules. We give the orders. Uh, that that uh, is is on the line. That U.S. global leadership is on the line. They cannot back down. I think. All of this is also tied into their own supremacist ideology of exceptionalism. Their exceptionalism is being challenged. How can they lose to Nigeria with snow, as they've described Russia, or a gas station? Um, it's 
it's deeply wounding their sense of identity, of who they are, of their moral and systemic superiority in the world. They can't accept losing to Russia here. Uh, so they they don't have a plan to win, but they will try to raise costs to Russia uh, to prevent them from seizing the whole country, right? Because... Too many people think of winning and losing this conflict as a binary option. You win or you lose. Who won in Syria? No, no one yet. Yeah. I've, <laughs> there's no peace treaty. There's no, you know, a Tehran conference with dividing things up or anything like that. No. Um, it, it ended in or it's not over yet. It's a frozen conflict. Yes, Russia stopped, you know, the West and GCC attempt at jihadi proxy regime change, but the U.S. is still occupying all of East Syria, sitting on Syria's oil and wheat fields, preventing them from economically um, uh, reconstructing and stabilizing the country. The Turks have occupied all of North Syria. Uh, they've We've got 100,000 jihadis under arms and on the Turkish payroll, uh, and there's no in indication that they ever intend to leave. Uh, so that is what the end of this conflict will probably look like. They're never going to sit down and sign peace terms with Russia. The West is never going to do that. And I, I can't see that any of the, the Banderites in Kiev are going to do that either. So um, this is going to get messy. Yeah, and I don't know. You, well, speaking of messy, I don't know if you've heard, and I, this is great to say, not great, but this is a segue into what I was going to ask because you did mention Belgorod, and we had a kind of a raid, a sort of probing. They lost like 2,000 guys and whatever. But 5,000. 5,000 guys. Wow. Okay, yeah. so today we have, and there was a lot of threat uh, threats about we're going to uptick these, these uh, terrorist attacks. Now we have another one in, in Moscow. I don't know if you see the breaking news. No, I haven't. Crocus City Hall the music venue in Moscow. There's been a, a mm -hmm. shooting. Three people in camouflage open, wi open fire. There are wounded, according to Ria. And our listeners are now saying um, that there is a fire in the building as well. So, yeah. I, I, how does Terrorism. how does that's yeah? How does the public in Russia react when? Things like this happen. Yeah. I can remember when the terrorist attacks were happening with during like Chechen wars, and but it was just kind of a different time period. What are, what are how are the reactions now? So what the what the West and Kiev was counting on from the very beginning is that not that they would defeat Russia militarily and you know in the big sense, at least, but that they're of they were hoping first for economic collapse with their sanctions that would lead to political regime change in Russia right? that would lead to the impoverished people suffering under Western sanctions, overthrowing the government that that caused this. Right. That was that was their logic. Of course, that failed completely. And still their their only option is somehow to turn the Russian people against the conflict and against Putin. Right. And so they want to hurt the Russian people directly. We've heard the Western mainstream media admit openly, openly that the Kiev regime strikes in Belgorod are targeting civilians. And they regard this as, OK, it's bringing the costs of the war home to Russians. Never mind that it's a war crime. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's OK when Kiev does it. You know, that's that's the logic or Israel, you know, uh, so uh, or or the U.S. for that matter. So this is what they have left is is dirty. I call it dirty tricks. You can call it terror. This is obviously terrorism. Uh, but they 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 feel that one of the only options they have left, however, obviously ineffective it is, is to, you know, uh, terrorize the Russian people in some kind of hope that they'll start protests and turn against the SMO and against Putin. Of course, it will only have the opposite effect. It will cause more unity, more rallying around the flag, more 
anger at the regime in Kiev, more anger at the West. It's only going to increase patriotism. I, doesn't anyone study Russian history anymore? I mean, in the West? We're gonna, I mean, what do we mean anymore? We course. never we never did. So. Well, I mean, at, maybe at the higher level, right? You know, at, <laughs> During the Cold War, right? There were Western, you know, military and, and um, you know, academics who studied Russia and Russian history. And maybe they didn't grok it, you know, in the sense that they understood it. But, you know, they had at least some academic knowledge of, you know, this tactic is not, you know, maybe it would have worked on the French, you know, or, or the Germans today. But it's not going to work on Russia then or now. Um, Russia has. It's just been through too much in the last few decades. It's been through the economic chaos of the 90s. It's been through uh, the Chechen wars. It's been through uh, uh, Syria um, and and this little you know week long fiasco with um, uh, Georgia. Russia has been exposed to plenty of conflict, economic deprivation, you know the threat of of political instability and what that can mean. You know, they will not allow a return to the 90s in that sense, which is why Putin, you know, gets 86, 87 percent election results, uh, because the Russian people realize how important national unity is right now. So this is not going to have the desired effect. And it's going to have actually a very negative effect because uh, the rest of the world that is not the West will see this. And they will become even less likely than they already were to be swayed to Western arguments about sanctions and, and everything else. So on multiple levels, this, this kind of thing is only going to backfire on them. I, assuming that some Kiev regime or proxies are responsible for this. This, this is probably more of the type of the Russia Volunteer Corps uh, type. Right, kind of like those sleeper cells that are there. Yeah. It's the post, -post yeah. kind of yeah. uh that sort of thing. It's so we have it's we really have... desperation. Desperation. Well, yeah, and then what kind of like war strategy is this? You have no ammunition, you have no artillery, you have no bodies. Um, just... you're waiting on all of that stuff, but in the meantime, you attempt a really strange probe in Belgorod that amounted to literally nothing. And that negative yeah, huge resources wasted yeah. there. Uh, the amount of Bradley's vampires, tanks, and okay, so again, supposedly that the chatter uh you know among Russian military analysts, war bloggers, is that all of that was intended primarily as cover for an attempted Ukrainian special forces operation to fly helicopters up to the border <laughs> and uh, uh, try to uh, charge in and seize control of a nuclear weapons facility near the border uh, in the Belgorod region. I don't I don't know if you've heard about this. Uh, this um, evidently was stopped. Uh, Russia evidently knew it was going to happen. Uh, they flew two helicopters uh, full of Ukrainian special forces while these raids were going on just before the election. Um, they flew up to the border. They disembarked their troops. The troops had to basically pass through one village on their way to this facility. And uh, they were already met at that village uh, by Russian forces. The Russian forces remotely mined their path behind them so that they couldn't retreat and so that reinforcements and evacuation forces couldn't get to them. Um, and eventually they tried to retreat onto the minefield. They tried to get evacuation into them. And essentially, apparently pretty much everyone, every last one of the special forces involved in this operation was killed and a very large number of either the reinforcements or the evacuation force that was sent to, to extract them. Uh, so what they would have done with a nuke, we don't know. I mean, nuclear blackmail, you know, I, who knows, but this, 
it makes a certain degree of sense that this that this you know that this seems credible it's the kind of insane batshit psychopathic stuff that Kirill Budanov is is you know made of you know the i like the dark cliched blonde bond villain uh that that Budanov is um i i think it sounds right up his crazy alley so um i i can't uh you know give whether this actually happened or not but that is the story of of you know again things are always done for multiple reasons so in an attempt to embarrass putin before the election you know who cares about a bunch of russian neo nazis not the kiev regime they'll gladly waste them and they'll waste their own neo nazis they don't they'll care waste their own no, they don't think they'll hesitate <laughs> to, to, to um uh, send uh, russian neo nazis on suicide missions you know and they won't cry for them. We certainly won't cry for them. So I, you know, I, I don't know. And when I say neo-Nazis, I mean, this is not a, a joke. This is not even West Ukrainian Banderite fascists, right? These guys, the Russian volunteer corps, Denise Kapust, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but one of the other underneath Kapust and leaders of the Russia volunteers corps is the lead singer of the neo-Nazi death metal band Moloth. Right, uh, with the two O's replaced by eight, you know, oh. uh, the Heil Hitler, cute little Nazi code. Oh, yeah. No, it goes far more than that. Yeah, they are, they are not. These are the the fire breathing Satanists of neo Nazis. They conduct esoteric Nazi occult rituals in their music performances, which are evidently all the rage in Kiev. They literally, not a joke, not an exaggeration, they worship Hitler as a god. That's who these people are in the Russia Volunteers course. So, uh, you, I mean, you have to imagine the level of derangement that it takes for a Russian oh, yeah. I mean, to it's, view so, Hitler as a god, not just a hero. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, I don't know whether they do. I mean, it's not done ironically, whether I don't know, maybe it's symbolically or or maybe they're just batshit crazy enough to believe it. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it's done in all seriousness. And, and you know, that's who the Russia Volunteers Corps is. Well, are you ready for it? We always have at least one tinfoil hat moment on the episode. So here's here's where we're going to go. So Victoria Newland gets rid of her or is leaving, shedding her skin somewhere and wash somewhere on the beltway. She leaves her job at the state department. We got all this to, to like tumultuousness inside of NATO. We know that Ukraine is literally her baby. That's like her nest egg. What are, I think that Victoria Newland is going to wind up in NATO. You, you think who's going to end up in NATO? Victoria Newland. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know for certain what happened, but I suspect that she was forced out of the State Department. Uh, this may not be a big U.S. policy change thing. There's no indication of that. But it seems to there was some to me that there was some deep state um bureaucratic one upmanship uh, evidently kurt campbell whom was selected as the deputy for the permanent deputy secretary of state to replace wendy sherman instead of uh victoria newland he's a china hawk and china specialist um but um evidently he was uh chosen instead of her and they don't get along that that is what what I've heard. Uh, it was something that was repeated in a recent interview by John Mearsheimers. Uh, so uh, we uh, we don't know. Um, I suspect that she was nudged out, and maybe part of that is a responsibility of of the failures of the policies that she has been pushing, uh, but. I don't know for sure. So, I mean, could I, I, she? I, I, like, I feel like they're not really ready to admit that their her policies have been a, an abysmal failure. I mean, if they were ready, well, to certainly do not that. publicly. 
Certainly but, not publicly. And but they even, can't back down from her. Well, even to go as far as to like remove her from the department, I think is 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 that's why I feel like she's failing up. I don't feel like she's failing yeah. out. She's gonna do an all Ursula. She'll fail up to the next higher position. It's just anything not, is possible. Not yeah. in the country. Um, I think it's very interesting that she hasn't said a word yet. I find that interesting because I thought she would write. I mean, if if she was forced out, maybe she would go immediately to the press and start bad mouthing the Biden administration or if she left in a fury over them not being willing to escalate um, against um, uh, 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 against Russia. You know, I, I find it interesting that she hasn't commented yet. She said nothing publicly. So maybe that means something. Maybe it means that something is in the works. Maybe she still intends to be viceroy of some big chunk of Russia someday. <laughs> so, you know, her, her masturbatory fantasy. And I'm very sorry for, for inflicting that mental image. Yeah, on, thanks on a lot. Who, thanks who a lot. is a casual victim. But, uh, you know, she's I've. I've called her, you know, the the Biden admin's ogre knuckle breaker before. I think, but absolutely, absolutely, hands down, the best description of her was from Rachel Marsden in a piece on RT that called her regime change Karen. That's a, yeah, that's what everybody calls her now. Brilliant. Regime change Karen. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, moniker there. But um, I mean, I was glad to see her go. Uh, I, you know, that that is one of the the few hopeful signs I've seen, uh, of course, you know, she'll never get what she truly deserves for what she did to Ukraine. Uh, and so many people have died, uh, you know, with, with her, uh, having a, a substantial degree of responsibility in the events that sent this all in place. But, um, you know, it, there, what you say, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility. Is it likely that we will never see her again? No, probably not, unfortunately. Well, I'm going <laughs> to, I mean, I hope she's not gone. What about the cookies? We have so many more coups, unfinished coups to go. We didn't get to do Hungary, Georgia, or Armenia yet. So, I mean, like, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of upset. We got to do a Niger coup, which was a wild card. So many countries for her to destroy. So little a little time. time. And now we're stuck with Samantha Power, who's like, she's like the dollar store, Victoria Newland. I don't yeah, she's her. she's like an understudy. She yeah, I don't want her. I want like the real, like the Hitler-esque villain. Like I want the whole thing. I think that her and Kirilo Budanov should, should shack up together. Why do you, why do you do this? You do you have to like give us some awful, like nightmarish, uh, mental image to go home with after every episode. I, I I don't remember the one on the last episode, thankfully, but maybe our listeners remember. But I, there was definitely one because you were apologizing. I think the last one had to do with Zelensky. So yeah. we're going downhill from Zelensky yeah. to Victoria Newland. Well, it could be a step up depending on your point of view. Uh, what's going on with you that Victoria Newland's a step up from Zelensky? Uh, well, I mean. Simply in terms, if you're going to have an arch enemy, <laughs> it should be a formidable one, not a guy who plays a piano with his penis. You know? Yeah, another picture that we probably don't need. Um, so just the last, 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 last wrap up. What are we seeing? Are we going to see any changes in Russia's handling of the situation in Palestine? Oh, Palestine? I mean. In in Ukraine, you can expect Russian escalation in Palestine. Yes, yeah, sure. No, no changes in policy or anything like that. There was no. A... I mean, what what can Ru Russia and China have no ability to do anything in in Palestine, right? They don't have power projection. You know, the the UN can't do anything. They they can complain. I heard that. Uh, you know, there are uh, reports that Russia and China have signed a deal for passage through the Red Sea. Uh, you know, now it's official that the Houthis won't touch uh, Russian and Chinese shipping, just Israeli and Western shipping, which is, I, I think it's already been that way for a while. Now it's formalized. Russia and China, this is horrible to say, right? 
there's no one that can save the Palestinian people at this point. There's only one person in the world, and that's Joe, I am a Zionist Biden. He's he's the only one who can save the Palestinian people. Otherwise, they're going to be ethnically cleansed from Gaza, um, it, whether driven into the Sinai Desert or into Egypt. Take your pick. Large numbers of them are going to die of starvation and disease or bombing. They will become the new nomad people, ironically, what the Jews once were uh, uh, upon a time. Uh, but in in the meantime, I mean, that's horrible. It's a genocide, right? It, there's no question about it. And it's a, a Western, it's not just the U.S., it's a Western-supported genocide. Uh, but this geopolitical, and simply real politic terms, this is wonderful for Russia and China. Right. This takes their eye off the ball. They are wasting resources, impotently pounding, playing whack-a-mole against Ar Ansala in the deserts of Yemen. Right. Wasting air defense assets, you know, uh, over uh, the Red Sea, uh, supplying artillery shells to Israel uh, that could be supplied to the regime in Kiev. This is wonderful. I mean, um, it, it's horrible to say, but the more they get involved into this Middle East quagmire that they, I actually believe they intended to to not be involved in. Uh, they, they've really done everything they can to avoid direct conflict with Iran. Iran has done the same thing, getting Kataib Hezbollah to stand down. Uh, so, um, but Israel is dead set on, or Netanyahu is dead set anyway, on, uh, dragging the U S into conflict with Iran because they can't win by their definition of the terms against Hamas. Remember there's entirely different, uh, quality of standards. Israel has made it clear. They have to wipe out Hamas completely to win. Hamas just has to survive in some form, right? Um, and right now, all the indications are that they are. So the only way out of this mess for Netanyahu is to escalate his way out of this, to start conflict with Hezbollah, to get the U.S. involved in a war with Iran. And as awful as it is to say, the more the U.S. gets involved in this, the better for Russia and China. That's that's very true. It's the it's the do nothing and win strategy, which is my as a very uh, perpetually lazy person. That's my favorite. Could, war could you thing. imagine what would happen to oil prices if the U.S. did strikes on Iran? Oh, well, not God. even that. I mean, we're in. A, they're already rationing oil on yeah. purpose. So, I mean, how much worse does the, the United States? gonna get and you know you are so right that we're now at the point that the only person that can stop this is joe biden i think that there were other moments in time where there could have been somebody else that intervened and and probably stopped it but at this point it's no, it's no arab state is gonna go to war with the u.s over hamas or gaza it's not gonna happen and well, even hezbollah and iran back down the only ones who want to go to war over the palestinians are the Houthis, are, are, are on Salah, which may make them the most moral people on the planet. Just saying. Well, and, and I will end on a high note because for us, Yemen is all always a high note. Mark, tell everybody what you're up to, where they can find you. I'll put the links up right now. Follow Mark on X, Telegram. Uh, X Telegram, uh, follow me on Substack. It's free. I'll never, you know, there, there's no, there's no hidden tier membership that you have to pay for or anything uh, on YouTube. Uh, you know, and um, I'm on Sputnik several times every day on on the radio shows. I try to post at least one a day on my Substack and Telegram. Well, thank you again for joining us, guys. Please go visit the website zdgeopolitics.com to donate or buy merchandise all of our proceeds go to supporting our current project in yemen uh filling up water tanks and feeding people for ramadan if you'd like to get involved please visit ddgeopolitics.com and we will end with a video compilation of some of our projects in yemen
Thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I guess we don't have that video. Anyway, have a good weekend. Bye. <laughs>